Lee's heart dropped into his gut. He knew exactly who Paul's dark men were and what they were after. It was why he'd risked his neck for Lady Cliffside's pendant. Why he'd been looking over his shoulder for more than a turn with a paranoia verging on madness. It was why he'd been studiously avoiding Paul's place for days, ever since he made his ask to a man who, it was said, could get his hands on anything for a price. Those dark men who'd been hanging about worked for the Jackdaw, and they were looking for Lee. Welcome back to episode four. If you're not caught up yet, I will leave a link to a playlist in the video description, so check that out. Question of the week, what are you reading right now? In my old age, I have become a notoriously slow reader. What are you talking about? You're reading right now. But stick around to the end and I'll let you know what's on my list right now and let me know yours in the comments. All right, on to the episode. I'm Josh Call and this is Last Coliseum. He took the long way to Paul's, hurrying down dark tunnels formed by the overlapping eaves of neighboring buildings, stepping over milk chasers sprawled in their languid euphoria. He kept his head bowed low, every so often glancing over his shoulder to be sure he wasn't being followed. There was a small fortune in his pocket. He rubbed the pendant like a totem until he came to her door. The hostel was nestled deep in the heart of the Copper District, wedged between a smallish bakery and an even smaller cobbler's. It was a tall, cramped building whose three stories had been built years apart and from different kinds of wood, whichever was cheapest at the time. They sat on each other like a child's toy blocks, a little bit chewed on and not quite straight, tucked among the labyrinthine alleyways. If you asked someone how to find it, you might call it the mismatched house or the crooked building, but for the orphans, waifs, and runaways who lay their heads there at night, they had a different name for it. Paul's Place. For as long as anyone could remember, the old woman, for it fairly seems that she'd popped out of her mother white-haired and ancient, had taken in the street boys who called home to the rooftops and rundowns of the coppers. She fed them and mended the holes in their breeches and slapped some sense into them if there was ever a cause for it. Her name was Paulina, though most everyone just called her Paul and she did the work of God. He stopped at the bakery first. The door greeted his lockpicks graciously like old friends meeting, which they were in a way. He left a stack of coppers in place of the plate of treats that he tucked in the crook of his arm as he slipped back outside. He paused at the door to the mismatched house and scanned the street, eyeing the dark alleys that crouched between the buildings like the gaps in an old man's teeth. A shaft of light from the upper window threw long shadows across his angular features. He didn't bother with his picks. He'd long ago given up on convincing her to lock the door at night. There was never any telling when a runaway might show up on her doorstep, bleeding and feverish. He should know. He'd been just such a runaway once. The curtains were drawn. The only light was in the faint, ruddy glow from the embers in the hearth. He left the cakes on the table and picked his way past the several too many mismatched chairs clustered around it. He found what he'd come for in the kitchen, a bundle of gauze and a bottle of strong-smelling antiseptic to ward off the infection he'd courted during his dip in the channel. He slipped both into his pockets and crept back into the foreroom, meaning to leave the cakes on the stair like a gift from the midsummer elves. He heard a swish through the air, then sudden pain flared bright in his face as something hard and narrow cracked him in the brow. He yelped and staggered, tripped over the padded footstool near the armchair by the hearth, and went sprawling. The floorboards creaked behind him as a voice that was creaky with age but full of vinegar growled, Saint Ham is my witness! Paul! He swatted the broom handle as it slashed him again. Paul, it's, it's me, Lee! He sprang to his feet and tore wide the moth-eaten curtains. A sliver of moonlight spilled across his face, his hands raised in surrender. If it weren't for the throbbing pain in his brow, the old woman would have been a comical sight, clad in her nightgown with a white scarf wrapped around her snowy curls, teeth bared in a snarl as she brandished the broom. Recognition broke across her features, and the flush in her lined cheeks darkened. Well, that's a fine thing to be skulking around like a sneak, Paul snapped as she busied herself stowing the broom in the corner and lit a small yellow glass lantern that lay on the table. She wouldn't look at him. You're lucky I didn't use me iron ladle, or we might not be having this little chat. Tea? No. Even with the ache in his face, it was hard not to smile as the old woman scurried over to the hearth and began stirring some life back into the evening's embers. 
Lee eased himself into one of the chairs near the table, wincing as his tunic grazed the stripe on his back. You're not one to greet guests with a broomstick. Is everything all right? She shuffled out from the kitchen, holding the big cast-iron kettle in both hands and hung it over the coals. The boys are fed and in bed, with a roof overhead, she declared. Cyrus is good. When she turned, he could see the exhaustion in her drawn features. He raised an eyebrow. There's been some men hanging round lately, she murmured after a moment. Dark men. It's in the eyes. She lowered herself onto the ancient armchair by the hearth. Lee's jaw tightened. There was no shortage of dark men in the coppers. The orphans upstairs told each other ghost stories of the boy stealers who prowled darkened alleys looking for runaways. In their fantastical accounts, the dark men were always ghouls and vampires. The truth was worse. Have they done anything? What do they look like? There's one blonde with a hook nose, and the other's bald with a black mustache. Lee's heart dropped into his gut. He knew exactly who Paul's dark men were, and what they were after. It was why he'd risked his neck for Lady Cliffside's pendant, why he'd been looking over his shoulder for more than a turn with a paranoia verging on madness. It was why he'd been studiously avoiding Paul's place for days, ever since he made his ask to a man who, it was said, could get his hands on anything for a price. Those dark men who'd been hanging about worked for the Jackdaw, and they were looking for Lee. You know them. He smoothed the furrow that had formed in his brow and shook his head. I, I know the type. He stood and crossed to the window, peering out into the night for a long moment before he snapped the curtains shut. He took care not to let her see his back. Tell the boys not to talk to them, and they're not fools, they know better. And, and if they ever did break in, you use the iron ladle first. She pursed her lips. Y you're scaring me. He came over to her armchair and kissed her lightly on the brow. Her hair smelled like clean sweat and brown sugar. I just love you, that's all. And the boys. He nodded to the stairs by the door that led up to the boys' room. How's Sim? Better. His appetite's come back. I brought him to mass this morning. His eyes flicked instinctively to the old lace glove she always wore in her left hand, the mark of the faith. He was relieved to hear it. The last time he'd seen the boy, he was still in the corrupting grip of the ague, wan, terribly thin, and totally unable to keep from soiling his linens. When Lee stood next to him, he could feel the awful heat radiating off the boy as he wept and cried out for his dead mum. Lee had never much been one for prayer, but he and Paul had clasped hands for long hours, pleading for the mercies of the judge and the king, the intercession of the slave and the potter. And after, he'd gone and bartered his soul for the medicine that might save Sim. He's been asking for you? Lee blinked. I've been busy. With work. His hand crept unbidden to the pendant in his pocket. Oh, have you found honest pay yet? Or are you still sticking your hands in places you shouldn't and hoping God don't see? He sighed. Don't start this, please. He stared into the red coals below the kettle. Her gaze burned his cheek, stern and unwavering. The last time they'd traded words over Lee's chosen trade, he'd taken his things and moved across town to a little ramshackle room above a smithy. She fingered the iron blood tree pendant around her neck. We'll all have to stand before the judge. Lee grit his teeth. After the gray cloak, she was the second today to try and scare him with the name of the Hellfire and Hail Punisher in the fourfold face of Cirrus. Why can't you just go to work down at the cargo lifts? You're strong, and they're always looking for men. Always looking because the penny a day the lifts paid wasn't worth the risk of falling off and dashing your brains on the cobbles. It happened only two or three times a year. If I was working the lifts, Sim wouldn't have got his medicine, Lee muttered. The kettle screamed, sparing the old woman the need to consider too deeply what he'd said. She passed him a chipped clay mug and he cradled it between his hands. His dark reflection glared up at him through the matted tangle of his hair. You're a good man, Lee. I know that. She shuffled over to the table and pulled back a chair opposite his own. He stayed where he was, leaning against the edge of the table with his face toward the hearth. But if you dance in the devil's shadow, you'll end up whistling the same serious above. He turned sharply on hearing the old woman swear. Her eyes were wide, and she pointed a gnarled finger at him. What in the blessed name of St. Opal happened to your back? Lee scrambled for an excuse, and for once came up empty. Work. And you're just waiting till now to say something about it? 
She was on her feet, her own tea forgotten. Well, go on, let's see then. Gingerly, the thief peeled off the bloody tunic and let it drop on the hearthstones. Paul held up the lantern to get a better look at the stripe the house guard's sword had left. She clicked her tongue against her teeth. Lee braced his hands against the mantel. Is it bad? Aye, worse than not getting your back laid open, she snapped. And then, in a softer voice, she amended, I've seen worse. She stood to go fetch her effects from the kitchen. Lee sheepishly pulled the gauze and the bottle from his pockets. Her jaw tightened when she saw them, but all she did was pull up a chair and order him not to move. He winced as she went to work, wiping away the dried blood with a rag soaked in liquor and warm water. Lee stared at the bits and baubles that lay on the mantel. A few pieces of colored glass sanded down and stuck together so they looked like a butterfly. A couple of twig soldiers with acorn helmets. A crude charcoal pole holding the hand of one of the younger boys drawn on what looked like an old floor plank. It's only a scratch, she murmured after a fashion. No stitches. Lee thanked heaven for his fortune. The old woman was a demon with a needle. He recalled the gash on his leg he'd earned climbing through a broken window when he was ten and three. Twenty-one stitches. Three years on, and he remembered every one of them. Paul worked in silence, applying a cold compress to his cut and wrapping a clean linen bandage thrice around his middle before she cinched it tight. Lee stared into the hearth's red remains, thinking about the old woman, the jackdaw, the treasure in his pocket. Everything was black or white to her. She didn't understand what it was really like out there. The pendant could change everything for them, once he found a buyer. Clear his debt, fix up Paul's place with enough left over to keep her and the boys in food and firewood for a score of winters. If the cliffside lords got rich by plundering the coppers, was it really thieving to take it back? I'll be done soon, he told her, wincing as she pulled the bandages taut. I, I just need enough to get set up, to have enough for you and the boys. He tried to catch her eye over his shoulder. After that, I I'll toss my picks off the stone bridge, I promise. Just be careful, she cautioned. The back door creaked as she dumped the bowl of blood and water and wrung out the dirty rag. Remember whose tune you're whistling? He sighed and told her he would. A smile broke across her cheeks as though that settled it. There's stew left from supper. I'll fix you some if you wash up outside. You smell like the back end of a goat. It was halfway outside when her voice caught him. And Lee, when you come back, there's someone upstairs who's been missing you. The thief grinned. He had little doubt who that was. He washed up at the trough outside, taking care not to wet his linen wrappings. He scrubbed his face and his armpits and shook the wet off him like a dog. When he came back, he saw that Paul had left a new tunic for him in a neat bundle on the stair next to the cakes. It was patched half a dozen times, but it was dry, and he was grateful as he pulled it over his head. Then he went up the stairs. He did the secret knock on the door. What's the password? A small voice piped. Lee looked down at the tray in his hand. I brought cakes? Lee! The door burst open. He barely had time to set the tray down before a tiny ball of red hair and energy shot through the doorway like an arrow and coiled itself around his middle. He scooped Sim up in a mighty hug and swung him round. Where have you been? The boy hollered, his voice muffled by Lee's shirt. You haven't come round in a seven year. He set him back down. It's hardly been a turn. The medicine had clearly done its work. When last he'd been here, the nine-year-old had barely enough strength to get out of bed, let alone nearly tackle him down the stairs. The ague had left him wretchedly skinny, with heavy circles under his hazel eyes. But the eyes themselves were bright with boyish mischief, and he fairly trembled as he scarfed down one of the cakes in three bites. Lee watched the plate do a circuit around the room as the dozen or so boys attacked the sweets like ravening wolves. He dreaded to think what Paul would say if she saw them scarfing down cakes hours past bedtime. Sim tugged on the hem of his new tunic and motioned him close. Lee crouched down. Can we go to the pits? He kept his voice low so the others wouldn't hear. His mouth and fingers were crusted with powdered sugar. Please, please, Lee, you promised. He smothered a grin. In the last year, Sim had developed an obsession with the arena brawlers who did battle in the questionably legal fighting pits scattered around the city. He kept a sheaf of old posters from past fights under his bunk. Maybe another night, he told the boy. He'd had a soft spot for the little redhead ever since Paul took him in when he was six. It was hard to say no to him. You said that last moon. Come on, please. Paul says I'm strong as a cow. He flexed his tiny arms to prove it. The other boys had finished their cakes and were eyeing him curiously. Lee bit his lip. 
It was all he needed for the others to overhear and pile on with their pleading. Keep it down, he hissed, not unkindly. Sim folded his arms and stuck his tiny chin out. His lower lip quivered. Lee's resolve crumbled. Go ask Paul, he sighed. If she says yes, suppose we can go. One bow, just one. Yes! He pumped a tiny fist into the air and went racing past him down the stairs. Thanks, Lee! He slipped the polished tray under his arm, one of the boys had licked it clean, and started down the stairs after the little redhead. He shook his head. Paul was gonna kill him for that one. Thank you guys so much for listening. It is genuinely super encouraging to see the likes and to be able to interact with you guys in the comments. So make sure to subscribe if you haven't done that already and share this with a friend. All right, my right now reading list, I have been reading The Martian by Andy Weir and I'm going through the biblical book of Isaiah on audio, which I highly recommend. All right, let me know what your recommendations are down in the comments and I'll see you guys next week.